six of the Abyssid History Podcast, an audio platform to examine pre-modern Islamic and Islamic hate history and a global medieval past. We're sponsored by IHRC Bookshop. Listeners get a 15% discount on all purchases. Visit IHRC Bookshop at shop.ihrc.org and use discount code AHP15 at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Contact IHRC Bookshop for details. We're also sponsored by Torath Publishing. Buy in time for Ramadan, a limited edition of Mufti Taki, Uthmani's new translation of Quran's explanatory notes in a deluxe thermo leather bound hardcover. Listeners get a 15% discount on all purchases. Visit Torath Publishing at torath.co.uk and use discount code POD15 at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Contact Torah's Publishing for details. I'm your host, Talha Asan, a PhD student School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Now on to the show. In and around 869 Common Era, African slaves used to cultivate the salt marshes of Basra in present-day Iraq revolted against their masters. Led by an Ali bin Muhammad, a charismatic messianic figure, the uprising would prove to be very damaging to an already beleaguered Abbasid Caliphate before being finally crushed in 883 Common Era. To explain the cause, details and significance of the Zanj revolt is Dr. Philip Grant, co-author of the Chains of Finance published by Oxford University Press. Welcome Dr. Grant. Thank you very much. The Zanj revolt occurred in the salt marshes around Basra while the caliphate was already preoccupied with their long-time Byzantine nemesis and other civil conflicts. What do we know about the social, political and economic context of the Zanj revolt and the religio-cultural cauldron of the time? Right, uh, it's a great question. There's an awful lot to say, although, as always with this period, in a lot of it is quite speculative. So, as you as you mentioned, the revolt took place in the salt marshes around Basra and eventually in Basra, and also over the other side of the river in what is today southwest Iran, Khuzestan, or um, as it was known then, al province. You correctly refer to various other civil conflicts at the time, so that so it begins in 869, as you said, or Ramadan of 255. So this is the end, what would turn out to be the end of the period that's sometimes called the Anarchy at Samara. I'm not sure if I like that term very much. It only seems to appear in, in, in some English language historiography. It's not a bad term in that conveys the idea that from the assassination of the Caliph al mutawakkil uh, in 861, there's a period where there's a succession of Caliphs, many of whom are murdered, and you know, various uh, factions of Turkic soldiers in Samara, which of course is the capital, has been the capital since al muqtasim moved it there early in the century, uh, the, the, the sort of maneuvering for position and supporting different caliphal candidates, and you know it, it's extremely violent, at least to the center, and of course the central authority of the of the Abbasid Caliphate is, is weakened. Um, but it's not anarchy. I mean, these these people are very rationally mo- maneuvering for for position, trying to take over, bring their candidate to the fore. It, it doesn't mean that the you know, anarchy is, it gives a sense of kind of generalized conflict and that you know, the empire suddenly falls apart. That's not, that's not what happens. Nonetheless, it, you know, clearly this is a, a, a very difficult period for the central authority itself. At the same time, there are a number of revolts. I mean, revolts are, in my reading, reading endemic to the, to the history of the early you know, the first few centuries of Islam anyway, of, of the caliphate. And so you've got your usual sp- suspects. You've got people who are called Kharajites, whether they really were Kharajites or not, is a, is a, is a, you know, a sort of contemporary historical, uh, historiographical question, but that's what they're called in the sources. For instance, there's one called Masawir in the Jazeera, so no- north and present-day Iraq. There are various Alids, descendants of Ali ibn Ab- uh, Abi Talib. In the north of Iran, about the same time as Azand, you get the establishment of the first Shia state, which is a Zaidi state. Um, and then probably most importantly of all, in Egypt, you have a um, a man called Ahmad Nuthulun, who was himself descended from the, the Turkic soldiers in Samara, who goes to Egypt and uh, basically takes over the administration there and rules as a kind of autonomous Abbasid governor, but with a very sort of conflictual relationship with the, the caliphate. And in Iran, uh, starting in Sistan, in what's you know, today southeastern Iran, um, you have Yaqub ibn Layf al-Safar, the, the coppersmith, who, who is probably the most serious revolt. So yes, so on all in all sort of sides, the, the central authorities are beset by you know, various rebellions, tr- 
of people with powerful armies who are able to cover a considerable measure of autonomy for themselves, even if they don't want themselves to sort of destroy the caliphate or to become caliph, they want to extract concessions such as being recognized as governor, having the right to certain tax revenues and so on. So, so definitely the, 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 the caliphate has a lot on its plate. The, the caliph, the, when the Zand revolt begins is al-Muhtadi, who has succeeded one of his half-brothers, al-Mu'taz, um, like al-Mu'taz, al-Muhtadi is very short-lived. His main uh, sort of contribution is to try to return at least the, you know, the, the, the palace of the, of the caliphate and uh, the caliph, sorry, to, to, you know, some kind of order. So he bans alcohol. He uh, gets rid of the, the qiyan, the, um, you know, the enslaved women who courtesans effectively, he banishes dogs as well, I think. Um, he does a number of things like that, but he's also powerless. So he gets killed pretty quickly. He's succeeded by another half-brother, Al-Mu'tamid, who, as it turns out, will rule for another 21 years. And so this, you know, with hindsight, we can see that that's the end of this period. But, you know, when the Zanj Rebellion starts, we don't know that in, in, in 869. Throughout the ninth century, so, so we're talking about the, the marshlands of lower Iraq, perhaps up as far as Wasit, the, the theater of the rebellion and into Khuzestan, as I said, on the other side of the river. It's extremely, for centuries and centuries, this is both extremely fertile agricultural land because of all the, the silt and sediment brought by the two great rivers from the north and um, a, a place where it's, it, it's extremely difficult to cultivate because the rivers are constantly eroding and forming new channels and forming marshes. And then in the summer heat, this dries up and there's the problem of salination, salt crystals forming. So it's, it's incredibly wealthy agricultural land, but it, you know, beset by these kinds of problems. So for instance, in the ninth century, we see actually there's a, there's a shift in the, in the tax revenues from uh, cultivation of wheat to cultivation of barley and rice. Barley and rice are more salt tolerant, so that pro probably indicates greater salination. Around Basra especially, so by this point, you know, Basra is, is um, very close to the Persian Gulf. Actually, then it was closer because of, you know, in the, in the intervening centuries, the land is extended further southeast. So it was very close, so the Tigris there is, is um, tidal, and therefore salt from the Persian Gulf gets there too. So you have this big problem of salination and at the same time you have jurisprudence which says and you're based on hadith which says that if you you know whoever clears a, a what's called a dead land you know, gets to keep it and gets to cultivate and gets to you know keep the revenues without um paying tax so so there's a sort of economic fiscal incentive for, for people to clear these clear the salty soil from these lands now the trouble is that's an extremely onerous job and therefore they they seem to have you know recourse to both slave and free labor so it's not that all the zanj or all the rebels are slaves or all the people engaged in clearing this topsoil the, the sebech they're not all um enslaved but that many of them clearly are and so you know as you know, throughout history, and we can cite many more examples, the people who are in, in control of the, of the means of production employ um, exploited and slave labor in order to do things that they, they certainly don't, don't want to do themselves, and that it's probably quite hard to, to get people to do as, as paid laborers. So, so we have this population there in, in the marshes working in extremely difficult conditions. Probably, I mean, there were some calculations done in, back in the 60s, but you know, probably working 100 days of, of the year, you know, on the basis that they would have had other agricultural duties, you know, harvesting other crops, I would mention barley, rice, wheat, dates, of course, very famous in Basra, and, and probably actually sugarcane as well, which was introduced into, the, in, into Khuzestan in Sasanian times. Um, so, you know, but working 100 days a year, you need a large number of men to clear all this topsoil. And actually, there, at least in the 60s, there were, there, were, there were still ridges to the east of Basra, between Basra and Abadan in Iran. And so, you know, it was even calculated, you might need 25,000 people working 100 days a year to do this. So it's so quite a significant labor force. There were prior unsuccessful revolts, but the 869 revolt would prove devastating with siege and sacking of major cities. Narrate for us the contours of events. Okay, for, before I do that, I should actually um, say that a brief word about the sources, because we ha we know quite a lot about the contour of events, thanks to the fact that um, Al-Tabari in his Tariq talks about it at great length. Of course, 
relying on one source means that you know there are all sorts of however detail means that all sorts of things are missing there are all sorts of biases and Tabari of course himself you know he collects reports akhbar from other people interestingly by this point you know we get especially the end of the revolt you know, Tabari was himself was an eyewitness of troops being sent off from Baghdad to to, to fight the Zanj so um you know, he, he's almost a participant himself. And he draws accounts from people who had been on the side of the Zanj, uh, including Muhammad Nul Hassan Nusal, Nusal, who was a um, actually descendant of, a, of the vizier of Al Mamun, uh, but also someone called Rayhan bin Saleh, who was, who was one of the, who was another Zanj commander. So he has this from people who fought, who although Obviously, in the end, by the end of the revolt, they had defected to the Abbasid side. So you have this incredible detail. On the other hand, you know, there's a little bit in Al-Masudi's Muruj al Zahab. There are two or three other near contemporary sources and then, you know, bits and pieces in later sources. So I, I will narrate the contour of events, but it, there's a, an incredible amount of detail. But of course, we're very reliant on, the, on this one source. So Ramadan 255, Ali ibn Muhammad, and we'll, I think we're going to come back to talk about him. He, uh, along with a small number of associates, he's been trying to start a revolt in Basra. This is actually the second time he's tried to start this. And he uh, comes across a group of, of, of Zanj who are described as uh, Ghilman as Shurajiin. So the, sh the Shurajiin or Shurajiun are the landowners of the Shuraj. And the Shuraj, if you know your Persian, it, mean, it meant salt, it comes from the word meaning salt in Middle Persian and in contemporary Persian, shur still means salty. So they were the, the, the ghilmen, so, you know, some kind of uh, subjected, probably enslaved people, although these terms are always ambiguous and, and, and the terminology is not consistent anyway. But they fall upon them in Basra and they're taking some flour somewhere and they, and they capture them and, they, and he, it's actually led by Rehan bin Saleh, so who's one of Tabari's major sources. And he himself is described a, a, as one of the overseers. He, he's both described as a ghulam and as someone who oversees the ghilman. So he's, you know, something we find in, in other slave systems too, that the, you know certain slaves are, as a kind of a policy of divide and rule are used to oversee uh, slave labor. And, and so Ali ibn Muhammad and his associates interrogate him and say, who are you? Where have you come from? How many Zanj and how many slaves are there? And he says, you know, how many of them are Abid, slaves, and how many are Ahra, free people? Um, and what do they eat? And what kind of rations do they have? And do you think you could go back and recruit some others? And will you swear allegiance to me as Amir, as, as your commander? And so Rehan says, yes. And, and so, so he does. And he goes off and he brings back others. And so the early stages of the revolt is very much like this. We have an immense detail about it, but it's a very localized thing. And sometimes we get even very pre precise numbers, like, you know, they went off and some Zanj brought 14 more Zanj, and, or sometimes 200. And so they gather a force. And at some point, they actually capture some of the, the landowners too and interrogate them. And Ali ibn Muhammad orders the, you know, the Zanj, who are now on his side, to beat them with palm branches. And then, interestingly enough, sends them off and you know, makes them swear not to tell anyone, anyone which, which of course they do. And so that raises the alarm and the local forces of, of the Abbasid Caliphate get involved. And despite the fact that very early on, we're told that the, uh, the rebels are not well well armed at all they have three swords and you know in one account of a skirmish um someone is hit on the head with a with a sornai a kind of trumpet and another one someone uses an oven it all seems very rudimentary and yet they managed to defeat the local abbasid forces led by a turkish soldier called ramais and so this is the first year of the revolt is very much like this they set up base uh, by a canal um outside basra and they fight a number of you know, battles, but they're really probably quite small, skirmishes with the local uh, forces, and most of the time they emerge victorious, but not always. And this means that they also recruit uh, new people. Interestingly, uh, in some of these skirmishes, you know, we see that there are, there are black soldiers on the side of the authorities as well. Sometimes these are, uh, are slave soldiers, sometimes not. And that many of these are captured and, and then they defect and they join in too. In the second year of the revolt, so you know, 870 or um, 256 in, in Hijri, that's when it gets serious in that having defeated all the local forces, the, the central authorities send uh, a general called Jolan Turki, so a, a Turkish general 
to lead you know, a bigger army. And he's also defeated. This, you know, and this is a repeat pattern. For the first sort of year or two, there are repeated sort of uh, battles, skirmishes. The rebel army increases in size. New people join. Sometimes these are clearly Zanj or enslaved people, but not always, especially some of the named people who become commanders. And it's very mysterious. That's why I say Tab- Tabari has, has immense detail, but we don't know like why one day a group of Zanj come across a man sitting, and he's very precisely described. He's wearing red shoes and a kalansua khaz, like a silk hat, and also some kind of woolen tunic. And he says, you know, I'm so-and-so, I can, his, his nispa is al Ispahani. So he's from Isfahan in, in present-day Iran. But what's he doing there? He's sitting with a bunch of letters. And he just wants to join. And they arrest him and interrogate him. And then they figure out he seems like a good guy. Um, and so he becomes one of the <laughs> commanders of the rebellion. So it's very mysterious. Like, where did he come from? What is he doing there? But 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 this, so this is sort of the first phase. That, so we can call that establishment of revolt and initial victories. And then there's a second phase where it uh, expands... And they start taking cities. So first of all, Alabulla. And Alabulla, a very ancient port next to Basra, Apologos in Greek, which obviously had declined in importance after the establishment of of Basra by the the, uh, Muslim conquerors in the Caliphate of Omar. Actually, uh, modern day Basra is probably where Alabulla was and the Basra of of the early Islamic period is slightly to the west of present day Basra. Um, But but they take Alabulla so, which is still an important port, and, and they set fire to it, and it burns down because it's made of teak buildings. They also uh, head slightly east to what was then called Abadan, uh, and, you know, which is now in, in modern run. It's been renamed Abadan, but uh, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not really not very far away. They take that, um, and they expand it, and they, this this phase cu- cultivates in 871 when they, when they take Basra, and this is a you know, battle which lasts several days, and it's... Um, you know, very hard fought and very complicated to follow. Um, but basically, you know, forces of the of the townspeople and and the uh, the Abbasid forces sent from Baghdad and Samarra, they 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 ultimately defeated and Basra is burned. And and of course, I don't know are these sources do the sources that Tab- does Tabari or do his sources exaggerate? But you know, there's a lot of people are killed. Uh, it, you know, it seems to be extremely violent and and is a big shock for the city of Basra. But also shows that you know the Zanj are formidable. Uh, or the rebels are a formidable fighting force by this point. So that, that that's the second phase, 871. And then there's a phase after that. So we have a lot of detail about that. And then for the next few years, there's less detail. But we, uh, and I call it this, the, the phase of the spread of the rebellion. And so here, they go into Khuzestan, as far as Ahwaz, which is, you know, east and slightly north of, of Basra. And eventually, as far as Ram Hormoz, which is three days march east of, of Ahwaz. And there's a sort of fluctuating control over this region because there are, there, I mean, it's very complicated, but there are other forces. Uh, Yaqub Nulayf is, is you know, very active there too. At various points, they try to link up with one of Yaqub's allies, who is a Kurd called Muhammad ibn Abaydullah. And, but he's rather a sort of tri- treacherous figure and he you know he sort of breaks his bonds with them a couple of times but but nonetheless they they they're clearly active there and they're active further north and they eventually get as far as far as was it which is sort of link of the but uh, sorry the limit of the batiha which is the, the great marshes of of lower iraq they get that far and you can see that there are a number of different commanders and they act sort of semi-autonomously so in ahwaz there is um ali ibn aben who He's known as Al Muhallabi, so he comes from this very prominent and old Basran family. North up towards Wasit, you have Suleiman ibn Jame, uh, who is described as a actually as a Maula Aswad of, of one of the Bedouin tribes, so a black, you know, a client freedman of, of one of the not not a Zanj, but you know, a black person of other origins. And he, you know, they, they act pretty much semi-autonomously. And sometimes you can see they have con- they're in conflict with Ali ibn Muhammad, who's who's based um, around Basra, and they they fight other Abbasid forces. So there's a whole, whole range of Abbasid forces with it's a revolving cast of generals because it generally happens that after they're defeated a couple of times, a new one is sent out to replace them to hopefully do things more competently. And here I think there's a shift. So in the early stages, very, it's very clear that the rebels live off plunder and they plunder villages and they capture booty from the people they defeat. Um, they actually they attack shipping as well in in Basra, but here they, they establish cities or something between a, a camps and cities, and we there are, there are three of them. For instance, Suleiman bin Jama has one called Al Mansura, and the most 
prominent of these is the Zanj capital, if you like, which is on the Abul Khasib Canal, just east of Basra. And that's where Ali ibn Muhammad, the leader, is based. He and it's called Al Mukhtara, and you know it's a sizable place. Although it's sometimes described as a as a as a camp as well. It's it's you know we know from the the description we have from the final stages of the revolt, which I'll get to in a second, that you know it has several markets, it has a mosque, it has prisons, it has you know big houses for the commanders. It's 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 a very big place, and they raise taxes, they mint coins, of which we have a you know three or four uh, survived to the present day and have been found. They, they have a qadhi, or probably more than one, so a judge. Ali ibn Muhammad has a katib, a, se- a secretary. They, they're constantly writing letters to each other as well as to the, the government forces. So, you know, it's, there's some kind of state apparatus, if to speak somewhat anachronistically. And they they have cl- uh, trading uh, relations with, with the Bedouins, who are obviously very important in supplying them. They also uh, fish, clearly an important uh, source of of food and nutrition in, in that environment. Um, so, so, so that that's that, that's the third stage where where it's both very spread out and yet also established in in, in these cities. And in the fourth phase, uh, it, I say it's sort of like the closing of the net. Like during this third phase, the Caliph Al Mu'tamid realizes this is really very serious, and so he sends Al Muwafaq, uh, who's Al Muwafaq. That's his brother, and he's during Al Mu'tamid's reign, he's really the one who's in control. And he's a very capable general and administrator, and he seems to have been really been the one who organizes the system of, of Turkic and Central a- Asian slave soldiers. And he, both he and his son Abu Abbas, who will eventually become caliph of Al Mu'tamid as Al Mu'tadid in 892, but that's a as a way away yet. They come and they you know they fight a number of battles and they're generally successful and and. Eventually, the final phase is, is the siege of Al-Mukhtara. And so what happens, I, so I said the third phase is kind of spreading out, but the commanders like Ali ibn Aben or um, Suleiman ibn Jame, they realize that they're kind of outnumbered or being, you know, outfought, and they come, they come to Al-Mukhtara. Um, a number of the other commanders are killed um, or captured. And so the, you have a protracted siege. And even if the, rebell- the dimensions of rebellion have shrunk, it's still quite astonishing. There's this sort of spine-chilling moment in, in Tabari's history when, yeah, you know, and it's very much described from the perspective of, of al muwafaq and the Abbasid forces, but, you know, they arrive outside al muqtara and they say they've never seen such a place. Like, they've never seen such weapons. Like, so many people assemble, such a, such mighty fortifications, and then the Zanj stand on the, on the fortifications and give this massive roar, and, you know, the whole place trembles. I mean, it's really quite spine-chilling. And so this protracted siege begins. And I think one of the most fascinating things about the siege is it's not just that the Abbasid forces are, are bigger and stronger and have better weapons, which they, they probably do. It's not just that the, the violence, it's the actual kind of policy of al Muwafaq is to encourage Zanj to defect. Both named commanders and, you know, orders were never given names in these kinds of accounts. And that when some start, Effect, his policy, so he parades them outside the fortifications and he gives them robes of honor. He gives them some horses, weapons. So they're paraded up and down wearing silk clothes and with fine weapons. And the defenders of Al Muqtara are demoralized and more of them defect. And even some very high ranking commanders defect, people who've been there from the very beginning. Even Ali ibn Muhammad's son tries to defect, although his, his father sort of uh, catches wind of it and stops him. So on the one hand, you have uh, the, the Abbasid forces who are cl- clearly very well equipped and they're using fire, flamethrowers, and um, th- th- there is a lot of violence. Just, uh, people are killed, heads are paraded outside. In, it, it's, it's deeply unpleasant. There's a sort of, you know, they're trying to terrorize the defenders, but at the same time, they're, they're, you know, and I think this is consistent with a lot of, you know, the way the Abbasids tre- treated rebels. It's like, if you swear allegiance to us, and promise, you know, repent and say what we did was wrong, but we won't fight you anymore. Come to our side. Well, then that's it. It's forgiven. And you know, this is, I think, m- in most of the rebellions against the Abbasids, you know, whether big or small, th- this is some element of this. And then rebels could be incorporated uh, into Abbasid forces, which is what happened to Zand rebels. And you know, we repeat their repeated references to, uh, for instance, you know, Khilmen, 
difficult to translate in the English translation of Tabari, they're often called pages, which I think is slightly misleading, but you know, people who are in some kind of subjected position were originally enslaved and then probably uh, probably freed, but still you know, dependent on their masters. And, and some of these are, are, are black. So for those of the Zanj, of those of the rebels who were black, and we'll come back to this question, Clearly, there's a suggestion that actually, you know, you can come and have a much more honored place here. And look, you won't be alone. And there's a, already by this point a tradition of several decades of having black regiments, black slave soldiers, uh, as well as Turkish and Central Asian ones, as well as ones from, you know, the Roman ones or Greek ones, if you like, Rumi or Rum, um, ones from the described as al Magharaba, which probably actually means people from Egypt. So there's a lot of, you know, there's this tradition of having slave or dependent soldiers in, in the army, but it's, it's, I think by the point, you know, al Mukhtar is under siege and clearly the conditions are getting worse and they're, you know, they're running out of food. Um, for a lot of the rebels, it, it, it seems that joining the Abbasid army is a better bet and that you can have some kind of, you know, somewhat honorable position. I, I don't want to exaggerate the amount of honor involved in being a soldier in the, in the Abbasid army, but you know. And, and so, the, so actually I think that al Muwafaq's policy is really that. It's, it's much that policy of enticing rebels to join him and saying you'll be better off with us and we don't bear grudges against you that, that really wins them the day. And so it comes to, it comes to an end. They eventually get into al Muqtara. Um, there's lots of fighting. And Ali ibn Muhammad is killed, as as well as a number of other commanders. And you know those who remained loyal to him at the end are either killed in battle or they're captured and they're later executed. And as for the, the remaining sort of rebel soldiers who are not named, who who, um, who don't defect to the Abbasids, well, that they they try to escape. And you know Tabari relates that they either died in the in the desert of, of thirst or they actually they were they were enslaved by um, Bedouins. So that's that's how the revolt ends. It lasts just over 14 years, and, and clearly it's 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 a, you know, a very major event, as you suggested in your introduction, and it re, you know, preoccupies the Abbasids, and you know it, it's very important in the formation of of uh, this kind of system of slave soldiers, the formalization and extension of that of that system, and you know strengthening strengthening Al Muwaffaq, although he never himself becomes caliph, and although he even swears allegiance to Al Mu'tamid's son, and he dies before al mutamid in fact it's his own son who becomes who succeeds al mutamid as caliph it's not al mutamid's son it's abu al um, abu al abbas his own son who's who becomes caliph as al mutamid so yes it's, it so it is as you can see an extremely important episode and one, one that raises all sorts of other very exciting questions an enigmatic leader emerges called Ali bin Muhammad who claims descent from the Prophet's household. What do we know about this figure? Right, so Ali bin Muhammad, I obviously already mentioned, he's, he is very important. He's a sort of, what would you call him, like a professional adventurer, I, I like to think of him as. As you said, he, he claims descent from the household of the Prophet. Clearly our, our sources are extremely hostile and and often he's just called Al-Khabith, the abominable one is how it's translated, or um, a- other epithets of that kind, like, you know, al Khan, the, the traitor. He appears to have come from a village called Warzanin, of which, as far as I can see, there's no other historical uh, record, but it was outside uh, Rai, uh, Rai, modern day Shahr al which had long been absorbed into the southern suburbs of Tehran, but in, in this period, Rai was a, a very important city. He was definitely Arab of, of Arab origin, at least on, on his father's side. And but he claimed to be descended from uh, the house of the Prophet. Tabari gives a number of genealogies. Masudi in his Muruj al Zahab, the Meadows of Gold, also gives one Var al Hussein. But he seems to have changed it according to whom he was he was talking. So his career as a as a sort of adventure professional adventurer slash rebel begins earlier. He had for a while been in um, Samarra in during the Caliphate of Al Muntasir, and you know he was who's, who succeeds Al Mutawakkil, but he's the first of these like caliphs who you know who only rule for a few months or a year or two before they're killed. He seems to have been somehow in the entourage of Al Muntasir. He wrote 
poems in praise of him. And in, again, in one of these bizarre details that's in Tabarim, we cannot explain. You know, he, he, is, he is associated with a couple of peop other people, one of, whom, of, of whom is called Ghanim Shetranji, so Ghanim the chess player. But why we need to know this and like what that sig the significance of this is, we don't know. But he doesn't, you know, he also seems to have made money by, um, you know, as a teacher teaching grammar, I think. But he, he doesn't seem to make much success of, uh, of this. So he goes off to Bahrain. And by Bahrain, we don't mean Bahrain, the islands. We mean what's now sort of northeastern Saudi Arabia. So off, you know. he tried, he, he formed some sort of alliance with some of the local Bedouin, whom we're told treat him as a prophet. And he even raises taxes, but he falls out with them. And, you know, he has a number of associates and, uh, and they flee. And then he winds up in Basra. Now, he's someone who sees visions. He doesn't ever seem to claim that he is a prophet. The accusation that he does occasionally gets thrown at him by his opponents, because of course that would be fatal to his prospects. You know, in a world where you know it's generally agreed that the last prophet was was uh, Muhammad, and no one after him can be a prophet. So, but he said he sees visions, bits of the Quran that he doesn't know by heart are sent to him in visions. He goes to Basra because he sees a vision that he should go to Basra. You know, a voice rather tells him he should go to Basra, and and at various points during the rebellion as well, he he receives either dreams or visions or voices telling him what to do. So he claims to be uh, an alid. This is very important. The you know, alids have you know, trem tr tremendous prestige. Of course, there's a long history of various descendants, especially of, of Al Hassan more than Al Hussein, but also of. Ali's son via his by his concubine. There are various there are various rebellions in the preceding centuries as well. So it's very normal things, a very uh, a good way of attracting people who have great respect for the house of the prophet and think that they should rule, or at least think that if someone's going to replace the Abbasids, whom they regard as corrupt or uh, and so on, then at least it should be someone from the house of the prophet. So so he has you can make that claim and actually very. We also, I think, the, the idea that there are people in the Islamic lands in the Caliphate falsely claiming to be descended from the Prophet is also quite common because there are certain benefits to it, apart from the immense uh, kind of you know, social prestige. Um, you're also entitled to to pensions or, uh, or some type kind of subvention from local or central authorities. So he, he claims to be this, although at one point he also claims to be descended from someone who'd fought with Zaid Mur Ali. So Zaid no, Ali is the, you know, if you like, the eponym of the people who become the Zaidi Shias. He, he claims to be descended from one of his lieutenants at some point. So it seems like he's, he's sort of manipulating these genealogical claims in order to attract, attract people for whom those claims are important. But anyway, so he, so he, he already started, tried to start a rebellion in Basra just before the Great Rebellion of the Zanj along with a few of his associates, and it, it sort of goes nowhere. <laughs> and so then he sort of drifts up north in the marshes towards Waset. He's actually captured by the local governor and interrogated. He manages to get away. So he's someone, for whatever reason, um, is, who's try, who's be, has a history of several years of trying to start rebellions and has gathered a number of associates during the course of these, uh, of these attempts. Um, why is a good question, and we don't, we can't really tell from the sources. I mean, okay, he sees the visions, and you know, when he's addressing the early rebels early on in the, in the Zand rebellion, he says, you know, we're going to fight against corruption and, and you know, establish just rule, but we don't know any more than that. He does call himself uh, the Imam, so like you know, that would imply that kind of leader of the true Muslim community. He also is, uh, it's called Al Mahdi. So there's a kind of uh, you know, eschatological dimension, if you like. But beyond that, it, it's very hard to say what his objectives are, uh, other than, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't like the Abbasids. He regards their rule as, as corrupt and ineffectual and unjust and wrong in, in the eyes of God. And so it's very much, you know, uh, if, you, what, if you follow the narrative, the rebellion is very much, you know, there's no doubt that they are Muslims. Uh, they're repeatedly shown, you know, uh, praying, for instance. He gives khutbas, they build mosques, he has, uh, has the khutbah read in his name in you know, one of the sort of sources of, of uh, conflict between his lieutenant Ali ibn Aben and the, the Kurdish uh, lieutenant of Yaqub uh, al-Safar I mentioned was that you know, they asked for the khutbah to re be read in Ali ibn Muhammad's name in the mosques on Fridays and then you know, they reneged on that promise and it doesn't happen. So 
I, I, the reason I say all that is at the same time, his opponents clearly regard him as not a proper Muslim and, you know, as a, a traitor and as a cursed. And they say, you know, they even and Muwafak actually appeals to him directly in the letter, said, you will forgive you as long as you come back to us and, and reject all this stuff you've been doing and, and you know, swear allegiance to us and like rejoin the Muslims. And, and often Tabari, when he's narrating sort of captures of uh, you know, victories of the government forces over the land. He says, you know, a number of, for instance, Muslim, Muslim women were found there, as well as Zanj women. So it's like the implication is that these are not, not real Muslims. But, you know, there's no doubt that the idiom of the revolt is, is an Islamic one. You know, all the historiography is sort of very agonized by this question of, is he a Shia, Shiite? Is he a Kharijite? Because, you know, the inscriptions on his coins, on, on the banner he's described as having, can also be attributed to, to Kharijites. Of course, it's rather contradictory to both claim to be descended from Ali ibn uh, Abi Talib and the Kharijite, because the Kharijites began as people opposed to Ali. But, you know, that's in, in, in a way he's an opportunist. But also we have to remember that, you know, probably his revolt doesn't fit any of those categories. And those categories are first developed by Muslim writers of the time, whether so, or, or slightly later Muslim writers, whether Sunni or Shia, and, and that they tried to fit everyone in, in neat categories. Um, and that these categories were then taken up by, you know, Western historians and Orientalists. And actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of missing the point. The point is that these were registers that he could manipulate and use. And, you know, you can't fit them into a neat category, but there, there are similarities with all sorts of other revolts, uh, in, in, uh, of you know, contemporary revolts and early revolts. Long-term consequences and analysis of events are disputed by historians, some emphasising class over race, if it isn't anachronistic to use those terms. The legacy of slavery is a sore point for many Muslims and Arabs today. How do you evaluate the Zanj revolt in the bigger scheme of things? Yeah, so these are these are very important and very big questions. It actually requires us to try to figure out who the Zanj are. And both the Zanj in the sense of like the rebels, which and they're often the name Zanj is applied to all the rebels, but it's clear that not all the rebels are Zanj because Zanj is also an ethnic or racial um, descriptor. And, and as you suggested, these terms are anachronistic. They are our terms. But of course, we're, we're speaking English. We live in the 21st century. We, we can't speak entirely in the terms of the ninth century even if we can fully understand what those are. So you, I think you have to constantly tack back and forth and remember that you know, if we talk about race in the ninth century, we're not talking about race in, in the 19th century in Euro-America. It's, it's, there are clear parallels, uh, but it's not the same thing. So first of all, it probably helps to figure out who the Zanj are. And the, the easy answer is to say, well, we don't know. So the, actually, the, the standard answer would be, okay, so in, in Arabic and then later in Persian as well, the whole coast from of, of East Africa, rough, roughly present-day su- southern Somalia, to uh, northern Mozambique is called Sahel Zanj. You know, much later, this will be called the Swahili coast, but much, much later. And of course, the word Swahili comes from the Arabic word for coast anyway. So that's the standard answer. The standard answer is like the Zanj came from there. And this is, you know, this appears in Al- Al-Masodi. It appears in other writers, Jahil, for instance, earlier and later geographers. Uh, they come from there. They were enslaved and, and brought to work in, in the, the marshes of southern Iraq and, and Khuzestan. The, the trouble is, so there, there are historians who've argued against this, and they've gone so far to say that well, it's not really a slave revolt at all. Most of them are free, and you know the sort of famous example of this is, is M.A. Shaban and his Islamic history, you know, this uh, volume two published in about 1971, which is this very um, you know, revisionist account which goes far too far in the other direction and you you end up with the impression that actually there's sort of competing groups of merchants you know east africans and persian gulf and even egypt and um it sounds rather like co- competition between multinational companies and you know shaban takes little bits of evidence and exaggerates them don't want to be rude about him but for instance he says that you know one one ever piece of evidence that this is not a slave result revolt and most people are not zan slaves is that there are jews involved well actually there is in Tabari, you know, and he the reference is to Tabari, but there's there is one Jew who turns up one night to see Ali ibn Muhammad, and they spend all night talking about the Torah. And the Jew tells him that he's predicted in the Torah, and they talk about certain marks on his body. And of course, we you know remember that the marks on your body is a sign of prophethood. So this is not at all evidence that there were there were Jews involved. This is a very mysterious episode, which 
tells us much more about the you know the kind of esoteric and uh, uh, you know eschatological figure that Ali ibn Muhammad might have been or was seen as or claimed to be. It doesn't tell us anything about the sociological composition of the revolt. But where Shaban and other historians who are a bit more sober in the analysis have a good point is that we have no, almost no evidence for any kind of slave trade from East Africa at that point. And so, you know, the sort of, okay, so one piece of evidence that we do have is you know apart from the existence of the Zanj in in southern Iraq in the first place is in in Al Jahadi's work, um, and he talks about the Zanj you know in his famous book about the superiority of the blacks over the over the whites, he talks about Zanj coming from coming from East Africa and he 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 gives name he gives names he talks about Kambalu, and he talks about Lunguja a Lunguja or a Lunguya. And so Kambalu has never been precisely identified. It appears in many other works too, but it's probably the island of Pemba of, of eastern Tanzania. And um, uh, Unguja, Unguja is the old name for Zanzibar. And of course, Zanzibar is actually Persian Zang- Zangibar, the coast of the Zanj. So, so that's where they, you know, he mentions that some Zanj come from there. And some Zanj who uses domestic uh, domestic slaves in, in Baghdad. So... So based on that, and based on later evidence, for instance, because Ibn Isfandiyar in the in the uh, in the following century describes a, a, a raid on Kambalu of 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 um, a slave raid on Kambalu on probably Pemba, eastern of the coast of Tanzania. So you know, based on this, and based on the fact that Zanj is the most common name for the inhabitants of the coast of East Africa, and that clearly there are people called Zanj living in Iraq, and actually they've been living there. For a long time, because there are earlier, much smaller Zanj rebellions, you know, as early as as uh, you know, going back into Umayyad times. So, so the assumption was always that that you know that's that's what happened. That's that's where they came from. It's a just generic name for the inhabitants of the east coast of 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 Africa. But but there is no evidence because in, for instance, Al Masoudi, who who does write a little bit about the Zanj rebellion and who twice visited the coast, nowhere talks about slaves, although he talks about. A variety of other things exported from East Africa, and you know there, there were trading links going back to the Sasanian times. And, and it's very odd that he doesn't mention slaves. Now, some historians and archaeologists read this as being an effect of the Zand Revolt, and it, it temporarily disrupted this. That's possible. There's an argument from from absence, but but there's you know there's there's very li- the evidence is very thin for any kind of slave trade, and then. Other people have argued on the basis of what we know about much later slave trades in, in the Western Indian Ocean that, that it couldn't have been possible, um, that it wouldn't have been economic, that, um, that you know that the infrastructure didn't exist, and so on. So I think it's actually quite probable that the, the Zanj, whoever they were, weren't in the main from, from that part of East Africa. Now, if you look at the, at the, at the sources more carefully, try to analyze what what does Zanj mean? You'll see that it's used in quite a sort of broad brush, brush way, and it doesn't. It's not always used to describe people of the coast. It can describe people from further inland. Sometimes it's conflated or associated with a Habish or Habasha, so Abyssinians. And there are also like Masodi has descriptions of of the Zanj living in East Africa, and, and they're often quite um, you know they're clearly different groups of Zanj, and they have different names. In the description of the revolt we have in, in Tabari, there's a sort of not quite perfect interchangeability of the term Azanj and Asudan, the blacks. So as is, is quite typical of, of the writings of this period, there's a general sort of like ethnic and or racial stereotyping and that you know all the people from over there from you know sort of uh, west of the Nile or you know what we think of as Eastern Africa, of course they didn't. Um, and everyone sort of west and south of that point, you know, they're all a Sudan, the blacks, even though they, you know, they clearly know there are all sorts of different groups and uh, different kingdoms and different organizations and languages and, and so on. That they're often these, you know, these people, uh, they're stereotypes and they're conflated and they're collapsed into a single group. And and then the other piece of evidence we have is that some of the commanders, some of the Zanj have names and they have nispers which indicate you know where they came from. For instance, there are at least two called Anubi, right? The Nubian. So Nubian like southern present-day Egypt and northern Sudan, which 
from the very beginning of the Islamic expansion into Egypt is, is, is you know, they have close connections with, with the Muslims, some of them learn Arabic. At this point, the Nubians are by and large Christian. And, you know, they, they write in a modified, modified form of Coptic or Greek script. There are others, there's a, a Karmati, and which Shaban mistakes for, for Karmatians, the other you know, rebel group which emerges around the same time in Iran, Iraq, but there's Ismailis. But it's not actually that that probably means it's probably uh, Arabization of Garamantes, the Roman name for the people who lived in what's now Libya and you know, in the desert, Fazen and, and around there. So we know that some of the named leaders, at least, were Africans, but they did not come from East Africa. They came from you know, further north, northeast Africa, and they probably spoke Arabic. Uh, in fact, Tabari says that when early on in the revolt, when Ali ibn Muhammad is addressing the Zanj, he divides them into two groups. And there's one group he has to address through an interpreter because they don't speak Arabic. And there's one group where they, you know, they, they speak, they, they do speak Arabic, including you know, Nubians, the Garamantis, the people from Fazen and, and, and other peoples. So it seems that the, the, the Zanj, whoever they are, it's a sort of general descriptor for a variety of people having origins in Eastern, Northeastern Africa. Who are often simply described as black, but you know they have a variety of different origins, and 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 some of them probably have been there for generations, and some of them, you know, the fact that they don't speak Arabic implies there is some kind of slave trade. And one suggestion that's been made is that you know they came from further uh, further north, and on the basis of later slave trade from Zaila, which we know about from Zaila in in what's northwest Somalia today across to Yemen and you know the Rasulid dynasty much later in Yemen that's you know was involved in such a slave slave trade. So that's logistically more likely than coming from all the way you know much further south. So so this is probably you know who the Zanj are and, and, and I, like I say it's very hard to know for sure. There's this question of whether they are slaves or not. And you know, Shaban again it goes all the way to saying that you know there is no, not only is no slave trade which which I think is uh, you know, from East Africa, which is not unreasonable, but saying that they're all they're almost all free and they're free East African merchants and so on. But if you read the account of the early stages of the revolt, it's quite clear that they are, you know, Abid or Khilmen, that they are enslaved, that they're being forced to labor, and that they're very happy to be free. Um, and, and that they are, you know, very enthusiastically involved in recruiting other Zanj. And that at, at some point, actually, early on, emissaries from the landowners come to Ali ibn Muhammad's camp and say, look, we'll pay you two dinars in one account or five dinars in another ahead to, to, for, to have our slaves back. And he says, no. But the, the Zanj who are sat there, and presumably these are Zanj who don't understand Arabic, you know, we're told that they're very worried because they think he's going to betray them and give them back to their former masters. And he doesn't. And he promises, he promises them again, no, I'll never do that. I'll never betray you. So for me, that dimension of it is, is, is very clear in the sources. And one of, Shaban's, one of Shaban's other arguments is there's no way that um, slaves could have organized a revolt, which lasted for 14 years and defeated multiple adversary armies, that how would they know how to do that? Well, you know, that's rather sort of contending attitude to, 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 be, to be polite about it. We know very well from both ancient slave revolts in, in, in the Mediterranean and um, numerous revolts in, in the Caribbean, uh, in, in, as far in the New World, that you know, slaves were very capable of organizing revolts. And you know, the phenomenon of marinage, where especially in the Caribbean, in Brazil and Colombia, to a lesser extent in, in the US, we, you know, s- slaves organized armies and fought and defeated colonial forces and signed treaties with them and then you know, took themselves into the interior of the islands in the Caribbean or into swamps, places which were you know, inaccessible or very hard to access and, and, and you know, formed kind of independent polities for themselves. Like, they, they, of course, they, if they could do it, why couldn't enslaved peoples in in southern Iraq do that. I, I think they could have done. Um, so I, I, I don't think that's an argument which is held, holds any water to say that they, they can't have been slaves because they couldn't have organized uh, a rebellion like this. At the same time, we do know, as I mentioned at the beginning, that some of them were Ahrar, and that Ali ibn Muhammad wanted to find out how many are free as part of his kind of initial logistics and um, uh, reconnaissance, that many of the commanders uh, were free, and also that there were other um, formerly enslaved people. So, for instance, one of the commanders is a man called Shib Bnu Selim, and he's described early on as a, as a slave of the Dabbasin. The Dabbasin were you know, people involved in the, in the date trade. 
right? And he's very early on, he's sent to Baghdad to go and buy silk for Havana, and then he later becomes one of the commanders. He's also described as black at some point, but he's that doesn't mean he's 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 from uh, East East Africa. Uh, we don't know, but so so clear. So there were other enslaved, subjugated, subjected peoples who were also involved. And you know we have to remember that slavery in, in, in a huge variety of forms was pervasive in the uh, in uh, the, uh, this period. And even if most of it, at least most of it we know from the sources, is is various kinds of domestic slavery, and most of it probably very humdrum. Uh, you know, although it's domestic uh, yeah, people would enslaved to be domestic servants, wet nurses, uh, and so on. Of course, you also have a lot of sources about the about the Qiyan, the so-called singing girls, which are actually a very demeaning translation, and you know, in fact, highly skilled women, some of whom became very influential, but were trained from a very early age to be like that. So there's a kind of industry behind it. Uh, you know, so so. There are all sorts of different types of you know, slave is a is a very broad term, and actually there are all sorts of different types of slavery. But you know they have something in common in that they're they're cut off from their kin, from their families, um, in some cases from you know their original languages and cultures, and they're subjected to the the wills and whims of of people who who have bought them and and, can, and, and in some cases can sell them uh, or give them as gifts, as we sometimes see in the sources. So you know slavery is absolutely you know it's a fundamental feature of of abbasid life even if we have very little information about this about agricultural slavery and if we didn't know about the zand rebellion we wouldn't know much else about it but so it seems to have been fairly unusual but i don't think there's any doubt from from reading the sources that a lot of the rebels you know that that they had been enslaved and made to work in the in the marshes and and clear the topsoil you are co-author of Chains of Finance on a subject which seems a far call from medieval Iraq and Iran, that being contemporary investment management and you also translate Persian what are other current projects our listeners can anticipate? Okay, so um, you're right it is a far, far it's, it's a very different world, I'm a great believer in interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary study and I've always loved um, late antique and early medieval history, and you know, as someone who's trained as an anthropologist and sociologist, I have a certain set of skills and tools and concepts that that I can bring to bear. Which, which you know, th- there are plenty of historians doing this now as well. I think if you look at the historiography of the Zand Rebellion, as, as with much other historiography of, of this period, that wasn't the case. And now some of these barriers have come down, and there's you know, people doing really great work including uh, race and gender and sexuality. But, you know, I bring, so I bring those kinds of, of skills and, you know, because in a, in a relatively distant past, I studied Arabic in Yemen and, you know, I translate from Persian. So I, I have the language skills, maybe, I, you know, I, I'm in awe of people who have the kind of philological skill that many scholars of the, of this period do have but you know i have enough to be able to read the sources and and question translations and and think about that so that's where that's where i come from and because this is not my day job so to speak at the moment i work as a a researcher for something called the Bear Gruen Institute in Los Angeles and you know my work is to do with changing definitions of the human in a world you know or how these definitions are changed by um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and so on. That, that that seems a far cry, as you would say. But but this is so. This is not my day job. But that because I have another job and I'm not subject to the to the pressures of academic publishing, I can think about this at a more leisurely pace. And and you know I think that's one of the problems of contemporary academia. And I have been an academic as well. Is that we are forced to write too quickly and publish too. Quickly. And there's, there's not enough time to reflect and think and really go deep. So, so I'm still working on this, and I really I, and I've given papers on it at various conferences, and I'm hoping some stuff will be published soon. Uh, that there's stuff in uh, under peer review at least. But yeah, I'll keep working on this, and I'm and I'm uh, you know eventually hoping to to publish and and to publish a kind of revised account of the Zand Rebellion, which builds on the on the work of all our predecessors, but asks new questions. And you know some of those. We've discussed some of those, not very much. For instance, the whole question of ecology and the role of water and um, the, the environment in it, because that has a, a very, you know, a very important role. And there's a lot of stuff in the kind of 
sociology and anthropology I've been trained in looking at, you know, how humans don't just create their world on their own, that they're always, you know, part of very complicated relationships with all sorts of non-humans, whether they be animals or or, or the landscape or the, or the waterscape, we might say, for some, some parts of southern Iraq. And, you know, e- ecological environmental factors are extremely important. So I'm trying to, I've, I've given a presentation about this elsewhere, but, you know, trying to incorporate these ways of looking at things and also, you know, building on a lot of the sort of great boom in India, in Indian ocean studies. I've said, you know, it's very, it's very unclear who the, who the Zanj are and like what kind of slave trade exists at this point because the evidence is so thin and a lot of it has been, you know, sort of distorted by people, earlier scholars, political, you know, considerations and affiliations and commitments and ways of seeing the world. So trying to undo that, but build on the Indian Ocean scholarship and see the Zand revolt as part of, you know, this at least Western Indian Ocean world or even a wider world, because I d- didn't talk about it at all, but Basra is connected, including via Siraf, which was the great port on the, on the, on the coast of Iran at this point, is connected to East Africa and it's connected to India and it's connected to China and Southeast Asia through long distance trade. And you know, it's no accident the Zanj actually attack 14 ships early on and, and plunder them. And also there are Abid, there are slaves in these ships. It's not specified, are they sailors? Are they being transported? But but they capture them and then, then they, they, they join the rebellion as well. So the Zanj rebellion is absolutely part of this Indian Ocean world of long distance trade networks and movements of people and goods. And so so I'm really hoping to, to work on that more and, and, and eventually to produce a book on the Zand Rebellion, which which takes all these exciting new areas of scholarship into account. Dr. Grant, thank you for being a guest on Abbasid History Podcast. Thank you. That's it.